Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Sika, and I am here tonight on behalf of the San Francisco Film Critics Circle. Part of our organization's mission is to single out and raise awareness uh, to the public of quality, important, and significant cinematic works of art, all of which apply to the film you just had the pleasure of watching, Chasing Coral, which won the uh, audience prize uh, for documentary at this year's Sundance Film Festival. Uh, I want to bring up the crew from the film. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. Writer-director Jeff Orlowski, um, producer Larissa Rhodes, former London advertising executive turned ocean conservationist Richard Beavers, and self-described coral nerd from Colorado and camera technician Zach Rago. <laughs> Awesome. All Thanks, right. everybody. Everybody. Well, our job is done, I think. Yeah, yeah. Q&A is done. Um, I was going to say anybody for a round of stiff drinks before we begin this uh, discussion, but uh, the reception's downstairs. Yeah, afterwards. right. After afterwards, um, Jeff, with with your previous doc, uh, Chasing Ice, which if none of you have ever seen, you you need to check it out. Um, you built an extremely persuasive case that our planet's glaciers are melting at an alarming rate. And this notion of opening up a door only to discover something horrifying behind it and the, the human tendency w w would be to stay clear of a similar door for fear of discovering something <laughs> uh, more horrifying behind that door. Uh, would you say that the first movie, I mean, given this, the subject matter of this film, that the first movie provided you with the psychological and emotional and whatever wherewithal to undertake this? Because I know you knew yeah. nothing about you knew nothing about any of this yeah. before you yeah. started. Um, it's a great question. Um, I, I think there were so many learnings in the pro so. If you haven't seen Chasing Ice, we we went out with a photographer, James Baylog, to document these changing glaciers, and and the changing Arctic landscape. Um, and I didn't know much about that either. Had to learn how to ice climb for that film. Um, and it was cold. It was a very cold project. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I think in the process of going through this, it was this realization that these changes are happening on the planet, regardless of whether or not I knew or our team knew what was yeah. going on, these changes are still happening. Yeah. So in many ways, like had we not made this film over the last few years, you, we still would have lost a bunch of the Great Barrier Reef. And, and that reality is out there. Um, I think I, we've sort of gone through our own processing of how bad things are. Um, if you're mildly depressed, we're far more depressed. Like we, we've been seeing it firsthand and, and the state of the planet is, is pretty shocking right now. Um, but that's all the more reason why we need to be documenting it and to share it with people so that the, the general public understands what's happening in these far off remote places that we don't normally see. There's a lot to talk about and I don't want to monopolize this, but I, w I want to ask a few questions and then we'll open it up. But, um, the, 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 the fluorescing scene off of New Caledonia. Um, so bleaching is, is what? It's a stress response that the coral is, 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 is giving off. Is, is the, the fluorescing thing, was that the only time you guys witnessed that? Is that common with, with other corals and yeah. uh, Richard? Yeah, Yes, I mean, I'd, I'd heard about fluorescing and I'd seen some pictures in, in, a, in a book and when I'd seen those, those pictures, it was often sort of pastel colours and it just it looked stunningly beautiful. Um, but I didn't think we were going to experience it properly um, while, while um, making this, this film. And it was really when we arrived in, in New Caledonia and I jumped in the water there and I, I just have never seen colours like this. Um, um, it was highlighter yellow. Um, and sort of Eve Klein blue, they were literally glowing. 
And when I showed the images to the scientists, they said they'd never seen anything um, of any fluorescing that is, is quite as vivid as what we saw in, in New Caledonia. Um, especially when we went off you know, a little bit away from where you saw that pontoon was, this was sort of a sight that I don't think anybody's seen before. Um, so it was just really unusual being in the position of being able to track the bleaching event and be able to see sites like these and document them and then reveal them. Um, the fluorescing is actually the sunscreen um, that they produce. Yeah. So this is the last ditch e effort. And some uh, corals will produce it, some corals won't. So you often get these big patches of white and then just a really fluorescent uh, uh, coral in the middle. Um, and it's, it's quite spectacular. Um, they, they do actually, I mean, if you, you ex, um, find a um, coral and it, it gives off an incredibly powerful sunscreen that, that people can actually use. Um, the ones that aren't glowing, I think if you put the ones, uh, touch the ones that were, were glowing, I think you'd end up bright blue or bright yellow um, as a result. But it is a very, very powerful sunscreen. But um, the corals in New Caledonia actually bounce back. So this is one of the good news stories from the, the film. We thought... They were, they were definitely going to die after what we saw there. Um, but these are some of the hardier corals, and that's really what gives me hope, is there are these, these corals that aren't able to bounce back from really severe events. Well, under the present uh, conditions of raising ocean temperatures, can new coral grow? Uh, so Corals live in a very precise range of temperatures, so they're going to continue to grow where those temperatures allow them to. Right now, the big worry is we're just seeing these events become more and more frequent, and so we're really damaging their ability to recoup rather yeah. than grow. You know, where they already exist, these corals will continue to grow as long as they're not being hit over and over again. Uh, the big worry right now is simply that we are moving at such a rapid pace um, of, of temperature increase in our oceans that every single year almost we're seeing new reefs, seeing temperatures that they shouldn't be seeing. And in some senses, that disallows them to grow. And pe people often ask if they can migrate, can they move? Um, Zach, if you just want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this is a super interesting concept that I was really excited about when I was actually in school. And there are really two controlling factors. And the biggest one is their lighting needs. These are photosynthetic organisms, right? So as soon as you get too far north or too far south, you actually disallow them to you know, get their energy needs during their winters. You also likely have too cold of temperatures for those corals to really thrive during that same winter months. And Corals exist where they can right now. They need structure on the bottom of the ocean so that their little larva can latch on. And they basically, where they are right now, is exactly where they can be. They truly have nowhere to go. One mm -hmm. of the interesting things that we do see is there are some areas that we're seeing new assemblages take place. So places like Hawaii in recent years, um, you know, kind of before the bleaching, we actually saw a couple species arrive in Hawaii that necessarily haven't been there before. Um, so it's kind of interesting in a way that we're seeing corals move around a little bit within their range that they already exist, but they're not actually filling any new niches. Can, can any of you speak more to the uh, significance of, of coral reefs as, as, an, as an ecosystem? I mean, I, th I thought it was fascinating, the, 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 the comment that was made about the cancer drugs uh, being extracted from some, some of that. Can you, can you speak more about that? Um, yeah, coral reefs are hugely important um, to the global a uh, system, really. Um, something like 25% of all marine life relies on coral reefs. They are essentially the nurseries of the sea. Um, they also support about half a billion people globally um, for both um, food source and, and income. So very, very important from a, a global economy point of view. Um, they've been valued at something like a trillion dollars to the global econ economy. But last year, I think it was globally there was about $26 million worth of new grants for coral reef conservation. So there's a huge disparity between what we need to be spending to save such an important ecosystem and what we are actually doing. Uh, it's interesting because we can spend a lot of time talking about coral and, uh, you know, ostensibly this film is about coral, but quite honestly, like, personally, I don't think it's about coral as much as it's about this larger level of systemic change that we're seeing. We are now at the place in time in history where human activity is potentially wiping out an entire ecosystem. 
And it's not going to just stop with this ecosystem. Our actions and the trajectory and the inertia of the system will just continue beyond that. Mm -hmm. So we can only save coral reefs if we very proactively work to fight and protect them. Um, in many cases, we're talking about what's the next ecosystem down the line that's at risk. And that's what the scientists are looking at and studying. It's, it's not just about coral reefs. It's about how we're changing all of these ecosystems. Yeah, it, it, was, it was edifying that the film ended on a positive note, but is, is the film's cautiously upbeat tone more, is it more wishful thinking than reality or scientific probability? No, I, um, I, I am very optimistic. We are, for the most part, we're pretty optimistic about this. Um, I would say my, my biggest takeaways in working on this project, the reality of what's happening on the planet is far worse than most people think. But then at the same time, yeah. the increased speed of the solutions has been changing so fast and much faster than we've thought as well. There, there's not one single tipping point with climate change. Um, we ha there are many, many tipping points, and we've lost a bunch of them already. And there are more that we're going to lose. And odds are better than not that we're going to lose coral reefs too. We're fighting to keep them. But how many more tipping points are there as we continue to move forward? And the technology, we're seeing electric planes being developed. Electric cars have revolutionized the, the entire auto industry. These solutions are coming out. Clean energy, wind, solar, all of these things, they are unstoppable. And they're going to keep happening more and more and faster and faster. And they're just going to get cheaper and cheaper. So in my mind, you've got these two curves. You've got the, the decline of the planet, and you've got the increased rate of the solutions. And when are those things going to cross each other? That's sort of the question. How fast can we make those solutions happen? And also, um, yeah, coral reefs are incredibly good at bouncing back after adversity. Um, they've yeah. done it for millions of years. So we've only got to save a small amount for it to then be able to bounce back. Um, I always get encouraged by other stories in, in um, sort of recovery. Things like uh, humpback whales. Um, we hunted them down to their last 4%. And yet they're now back up to 65%, which is an amazing recovery in a very, very short period of time. And arguably, corals are, are better at recovery uh, than, than whales. So uh, as long as we save enough, and, and it's really about what we do in the next sort of five to ten years, which will di dictate whether we can save enough, um, that will allow corals reefs to, to bounce back globally. The, the irrefutable uh, visual evidence presented here would be hard for, I think, I think, you know, even the most stubborn climate change skeptic to ignore. I'm curious if you've shown this to any of those, and if so, what was their response? Um, we've had no real skepticism about the film I and mean, about the science of the film. Mm -hmm. um, when we had Chasing Ice come out five years ago, uh, at screenings, we definitely still had skepticism. Um, yeah. But I think in part with the changing society, with the changing evidence, with the changing kind of zeitgeist around what's happening, uh, as well as in many ways, I feel like this story is a new story that people haven't seen before. So they might have already validated why sea level rise is part of a natural cycle and why glaciers are part of a natural cycle and fires and droughts. And those are all things that have always happened for all eternity. Um, but they've never seen coral bleaching. This is a new phenomenon. If you go to any of, any of the, Ove has this line where um, all of the traditional communities all around the world where people have been living next to coral reefs for thousands and thousands of years, in none of those cultures is there a word for white coral. It's not some ancestral thing that we've known about for, for you know, millennia. Um, this is a new phenomenon that has been just coming to the surface recently. So I, I think in part all of those things added together, it, it's becoming that much harder to refute the science on climate change. Is there, I mean, is there any way to, to measure specifically if this movie has moved the needle at all in terms of just general yeah. awareness of this. Um, well, it, it is a great question. It's something, so in addition to making the film, we've now developed an entire impact team. So half of our company, actually more than half of the company now, is dedicated just to leveraging the film for impact. Um, and Meg, uh, one of our partner, Meg is in the audience on our partnership team. Um, and so uh, we, we tr try to ask that question all the time. How can we use this film for change? Um, we did some actual metrics with Chasing Ice. So we were testing to see how effective it was. And we have some preliminary data that we never released on that film um, about 
just seeing really that it was moving skeptical audiences to realizing that climate change was real. And we haven't done that same testing with this film yet, um, but we're really trying to use this film for getting beyond the choir, finding skeptical audiences and working really deeply with that. Um, if you're interested, we can talk about that more in the reception downstairs. There's a lot, we spend all of our time thinking about how do we actually solve this political problem? How do we solve the, the climate denialism problem? Um, how can we as a film team, as a communications team, use our skills and resources to make it an impact in that area. So um, we can spend a lot of time talking about that during the reception if you're interested. So Larissa, how, how is it keeping these guys all in order here? <laughs> a <Impossible>. nightmare. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I, I think we feel really lucky. It was um, quite a journey and an experience. I, I think as you saw in the credits, there are over 300 people that worked on this film from around the world. Um, so well, let me ask the guys, how indispensable was, was she as a producer? <laughs> We would probably still be stuck on an still island stuck somewhere. Not in the true. water. <laughs> it, it really is. It's quite an amazing experience, especially when you don't really know where the story is going. I remember the very first trip um, Jeff took, actually, uh, there had been a giant flood in, in Boulder, um, a, a one in a thousand year flood, and Jeff's passport actually got flooded. His house got flooded, um, and they wouldn't let him fly because he didn't have a, a passport that would work. But at that time, it was literally Jeff and Andrew and, and Richard's team. Um, and to think how far the film has come, it really is a testament, I think, to following the story and, and just to how big the magnitude of this problem was to be able to do the global call where all of these people from around the world were showing us what was happening in their backyard. I think that really brought the story full circle to say this isn't just us operating in a bubble. There are people around mm. the world that are experiencing it, but also people that really care. This is the first feature documentary that Larissa produced, um, and it's a ridiculous testament to being able to make anything happen, so just major, major. I have to say my husband is in the audience, and I couldn't, he was a camera operator on the film, and I couldn't have done it without him. Can, can you, uh, can, yeah, okay, let's, yeah. <laughs> Is the film being shown to Congress, or are there plans to show yeah. the film to Congress? Yeah, we, we've done a screening uh, on the Hill already. Um, we screened at the United Nations. Next week we're going back to D.C. screening again in D.C., Smithsonian, a couple of screenings out there. Um, when, when you do a well, what screening, was the when like you do a screening on the Hill, um, you don't get all the congressmen and congresswomen to come. Like right. that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, you get yeah. a handful at best, and you get staffers at best. Um, quite fortunately, we had a good number. We had five different um, congresspeople from around the country come and attend the screening. One particular insight: there was one representative who um, he's been a diver for 40 years. Um, and I won't, I won't out him explicitly, but he, he's been a long time scuba diver and really, really avid and passionate about the oceans. And he saw the film and he came up to us afterwards and he, he said he was almost ashamed to admit that he didn't know that coral bleaching was going on. He didn't yeah. know how bad it was. And this is somebody who spends a lot of time in the ocean. Now, that might seem odd, that might seem shocking to some people, um, but it's, it's this interesting thing that we realized along the way of all the people who go recreationally diving, if you go out for a vacation, you're gonna go travel, you're gonna go fly someplace and you wanna go see the, the reefs, you normally get brought to the prettiest, healthiest part of that entire reef. Right. Nobody shows you the bleaching. They don't show you the devastation. And there have been a number of sites, I remember one of the first trips we did in Australia, we went to this beautiful, amazing reef and then we just went around the corner and kept swimming another you know, 50 yards and everything was devastated. And that, that's sort of the reality of what's going on. This is still, access to these reefs is driven first and foremost by a tourism industry. And in Australia, they're struggling with how do, how do you present this to the public? How do you talk about this to the public? Because they're concerned that they, by revealing the truth of what's happening, they're going to destroy their entire tourism industry. Um, so it's a, it's a huge, huge concern in Australia. Questions. I, you know, I normally come into the audience and and hand the mic, but the way the setup is, is yeah. going to be kind of hard. So if you just just shout out, and we'll repeat if we need to. Yes, great. It. 
The most surprising response uh, Zach got from kids by, as a result of taking the, the bus out. You know, the most surprising response I actually think comes from screenings like this that are done with kids, in particular with high school students, because they ask the most innovative and creative questions um, in comparison to anybody else. And most of the time I find myself sitting there saying, you know what, if you ask, answer that question, you're getting a PhD real quick. Um, so so they, they are really critically thinking, and you can tell that this next generation really does care and they want to feel empowered and it seems that they're stuck into a system in which they're forced not to feel like they have any power. Um, and so I think getting them in the bus is, is extremely fun. I've got sand in the back, there's a bunch of hammocks, it's like a literal beach on wheels in which I do the virtual reality. Um, so the thing that I think is so interesting and we kind of alluded to it earlier is, you know, no matter where you are in the world or what their belief systems might be, um, I've never found anybody that's anti-ocean. Um, and, and kids tend to really enjoy it, and it's the most rewarding thing for me. I grew up in Colorado, so most of the kids that I do get to engage with have either never seen the ocean and honestly likely will never see the ocean. Um, and so to be able to share those images and to just be able to give them the problem, you don't have to get into the science. Um, you show them a coral reef, and then you say, that looks healthy, right? And they all agree. And then you say, what's wrong with this one? And they all go, it's white. And then you show them a dead reef, and they don't really need much explanation. They get it. If you just use the visual cues and the, the imagery itself, it kind of just takes them down their own path. You don't have to give them a curriculum and you don't have to walk into a classroom and say, this is what you're gonna walk away with. You kind of can allow them to go on this journey on their own time and they, they make their own conclusions. And that was surprising to me, but it also is what gives me a lot of hope. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about the editorial perspective. You know, you do a very, just fact with uh, you know, the dip and the lift. Um, I mean, you could have presented it as a, a political disaster or an engineering challenge or an economic, you know, whatever, right? You know, or a spiritual. I mean, did you, how did you decide just what angle to take? The yeah. question is, how did, how, how did they decide what angle uh, to take, what editorial perspective? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, when when you're in the development of a project like this, we didn't really know where it was going to go. So at the start, we were following Richard. We were following a lot of different storylines. Um, we weren't sure for a long time if we were being introduced to the ocean. And I remember the very first conversations that we were having with Richard and a bunch of scientists. We were learning about ocean acidification, which we didn't cover at all. Um, plastics is a huge issue. There's dynamiting of coral reefs. There's overfishing. There are all these different things. So over time, the story kept honing in on the bleaching story. Um, something that we learned from Chasing Ice and that we wanted to keep um, uh, similar in this film was to keep it very observational and very fact-based. Uh, as little opinion as we can put into it. Um, I find that it, it allows, it makes it harder to disagree with. It makes it harder to try to refute. Mm -hmm. um, we, everything in this film has been multiple times over fact-checked by a slew of scientists. So we, we can stand very comfortably and confidently on every factual statement in the film. And so you can't deny any of the facts. You can't deny our photography. So it leaves climate skeptics with little to attack. Um, so that's one line of thinking, but more than anything, it really is like how can we draw people in emotionally and how can we set the story structure up in a way that can take you along this journey. So as you're meeting the team and as you're learning, it's this balance between the information and the story, trying to plant as little information as necessary, but just the information that's necessary to, to follow along with the story. You need to understand what coral is, how they function. You need to know what bleaching is and, and how they die, what they look like when they die. And, and and then as you're going along on the journey of trying to capture the imagery, um, hopefully we can thread those two stories together back and forth so that you're, you're still engaged with this quest that the team is on while at the same time learning the key p little bits of information that you need. So that's sort of how we, we think of it. Um, there is no cookie cutter for any film by any means. But it, a, as you, once you figure out what that main quest is and what you're trying to build towards with the climax of the film, it makes it that much clearer in terms of what needs to be in the film or not. And it makes it that much easier to know there are other storylines that we had that it just didn't fit in this story. Um, and there we could make another several films with the outtakes. Um, there's, we shot, I don't even remember how many hundreds of hours of footage at this point. Um, and you boil it down to this you know, what we tried to package into this really tight piece. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of identifying what the story should be and what it shouldn't be, and it's saying no, 
many more times than saying yes. Um, it helps to have go a ahead, coral go nerd. That's yeah. <laughs> Sp speaking of editorializing, then, and since you didn't go there in, 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 the, in the film, I'm going to put you all on the spot and ask you to speak to this film in context of the current political situation in this country. Should I start on that one? Um, yeah, I, we, we get often asked about the politics of all of this. Um, you know, we haven't been taking the steps necessary to adequately solve climate change for multiple presidencies, not just this one. Right, so we have a lot that needs to be done um, to solve this. This is, not a, this is not a problem that any one of us can solve. We need to solve it collectively. The most inspiring thing, having come out of President Trump pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement, has been the massive um, uptick and just engagement from communities all across the country and around the world. Well, most people saying, didn't even know what it was. So a lot right? of people right. weren't aware. Right. I mean, yeah, the Google search results after Trump pulled out, like they, they spiked right. for the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, but the, the really exciting thing there is that states and cities are realizing that they are the ones that have the power to solve this. That this, the solutions haven't been coming at the federal level and we can't expect them to come at the federal level. And it is that much more empowering at the local level for us to take action and solve it. That's why we included the list of cities and states at the end of the film that are taking those proactive steps that are looking to solve this in their own ways. Um, because if we can get to that level, if local communities can can organize and do their own local solutions. That's the most effective way for us to solve this and address this and in the near future. Notice Berkeley was in there too. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So, so, um, oh, sir. I thought you were going to first say the baby turtle was the most impactful, <laughs> but yeah, well, it kind of was. <laughs> so here's something really interesting about that scene that doesn't, we couldn't fit it into the film because unfortunately we don't have smell of vision but Richard knows this well also. Um, we would go on these dives every day and you hit the surface and you stink like rotting tissue. Um, you're swimming around literally in a soup of tissue, literal animal material that is rotting away and it's disgusting. Um, you really can't describe that smell and it's every single day you're getting out of the water and you're just disgusted by yourself because you've been rolling around in, in all this material. Um, and that was something that uh, I always wanted to see make it into the film and again we just couldn't get that, um, you know, that really strong point across about how disgusting this really was. Um, but that was a day that was really tough because at the beginning of when I first met Jeff, I even had told him, like, you know, let's stay away from soft corals. I didn't think soft corals could bleach. I thought that the likelihood of seeing something like that was just so extraordinarily low that we'd be wasting all of our time and putting resources into something that we were going to fail at doing again. And then to be on the forefront of the largest, you know, ecological disaster, arguably in modern history, um, to see these soft corals just literally melting away and to, it was, it had to become part of the story and we just had to make this decision to say, you know what, let's start including this because it's so much more visual to see this literal like disintegrating and falling apart of these organisms rather than just the stark white. It added a new variable into the way that we could visualize the issue and kind of in a more gross and engaging way for you guys, I think. I know we're just getting started, but we, we've been just, we're being kindly asked to sort of segue to the, uh, to the reception in the uh, aquarium. So, uh, you know, if you like this film, um, spread the word. Uh, it's, on, it's available on Netflix, isn't it still? So yeah. it's, it's a Netflix original, um, so you can watch a streaming globally on Netflix. One of the cool things about it being on Netflix, uh, there's this new technology called HDR that's coming out on these new monitors. So if you watch it on Netflix, right. you can see the colors even more vibrantly than, than you saw tonight, um, which is pretty cool. I just want to wrap, if, if our team members can just stand up briefly. I know Meg is here, David and Linda Cornfield here, Mark Crawford, Jenny Lee. If we can just give them all a round of applause. Linda's in the back. Um, this has been a major, major labor of love for everybody for such a long time. We couldn't have done it without everybody. Thank you guys so much. All right, and thank uh, Jeff Orlowski, Richard Beavers, Zach Rago, and Larissa Rhodes for doing this. And please, um, 
come to the uh, reception in the aquarium. I, it, it's down in the coral reef tank. So Zach, Zach can give you a, a tour of all the corals down there and identify <laughs> all the species. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.